Um, thank you for coming out tonight. Tonight is the, the this is the 35th anniversary of the bookstore. The bookstore was born 35 years ago today. Um, um, so tonight we're here with my uh, Ye, 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 uh, Carlos Gutierrez um, and Kurt Hollander for several ways to die in Mexico City. And Carlos. And Carlos will be MC, moderating. <laughs> Um, welcome everybody. Um, it's going to be a very casual uh, sort of conversation. Um, it's about the perfect excuse to talk about Mexico City and New York, which they rarely get to talk, to talk together, like a, um, um, particularly as, 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 as big cities in North America, they rarely get placed in the same in the same uh, discussion. So I think that it's a great opportunity. Um, I guess I'll tell a little bit of my personal story um, in the sense that I moved to New York in 96 and, um, and of course uh, I've seen the whole transformation of the city and uh, and what I think I found interesting is like the, in 96 uh, you know I was uh, um, I was really paranoid because I had heard New York was very was very dangerous so you know coming from Mexico City which in 96 was already starting to get uh, dangerous um, so, you know, I was very paranoid. I came to study at NYU, um, and I remember at NYU they would give um, special uh, workshops uh, for students, for new students, uh, in, in terms of safety. Like, you would never go at dark to Washington Square Park. <laughs> that was 96. <laughs> so, it's interesting because uh, Mexico City for many, many years was a really quiet city. Uh, we were talking about that earlier. And it was in the probably in the 80s, 85, uh, probably the mid 80s, that a lot of the, the, the big problems of the city exploded, um, like pollution, traffic, uh, and started to get very violent, uh, uh, probably in, in the early 90s, like mid 90s, it mm -hmm. already exploded. Um, and New York went the opposite way, you know? Um, it used to be very dangerous, and now you know, it went the opposite way. Um, so I, I, I find that, that very, uh, very ironic. Um, another thing about, about New York that I found very interesting was um, after 16 years living in New York City, I've seen the city stop to completely paralyze in many occasions now. September 11, the blackout, more recently Sandy, and even there's been instances that it's raining a lot and the subways get flooded and then the city gets completely chaotic. Mm -hmm. Whereas Mexico City, a 20 plus million city, you know, I've, when I lived there, it never, I, never, I never saw it stopped. Even even with the big, big earthquake in, in 1985, which was uh, tremendous, and I don't know, um, about 30,000 people died. I mean, there's different numbers, but but it was a, it was a, had a major impact. But even even then, the city continued. It was like a, such a, the dynamic. The city was so dynamic that uh, it never really um, stopped to a halt. Like an amoeba, right? Like an amoeba, keeps moving. Um, so I mean, some some this, some some ideas uh, uh, I I wanna I wanna uh, bring out later to the discussion. First, I guess uh, we're gonna hear uh, Kurt uh, introduce uh, bits from his book, the book that we're celebrating, and um, and then we'll 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 hear from uh, uh, Nadia. Kurt, thanks, Colin. Thanks for coming down. Uh, Thirty-five years. That's that's a long time. And in fact, I think I was there early on. I mean, I used to come, used to go to the bookstore when it was on the, on the north side of 8th Street. And I used to have a literary journal here called the Portable Lower East Side. And I think I put the, uh, I put the first um, call for submissions in the, in the St. Mark's bookstore. I think that was the first thing I, I hung up. So it was really, obviously, uh, an important place for my kind of literary development. And Arthur was back there. I, I know he used to tell me stories. He helped renovate the, the store when it was on the south side of the street. And he was famous because he, he pissed in the shellac on the, on the shelves or something. I'll let, the, I'll let them know. Yeah. But I mean, this bookstore has always been like a, I mean, especially in later years, has always been kind of like a, an island, of, I mean, a refuge to come in out of the cold or culturally and, and weather-wise. So I'm, I'm glad it's still around. Um, this book I've been working on, I wrote over the course of like six years, researched and wrote. And it kind of started out just as articles on 
the way people died and death from from water, air, food, and alcohol. It was really kind of death, death, death. I guess I was in a in a in a bad space, um, but then kind of expanded and ultimately became an autobiography. Um, I'm just going to read a bit from, well, I'll read the first part, which is the, the, how it leads up to me writing the book. Um, and I'm not going to talk about myself because I pretty much say it all in the book, so I'll just start, start reading. Um, the chapter is called The End, uh, and the sub, the sub section is Death in the City. The end of our life is our final act. Unlike being born, a moment in which we are basically oblivious, death often catches us wide awake and in the full senses, often even at the peak of our existence. While we are all born more or less at the same age and in the same way, death can come upon us at any time, in any place, and can happen in an infinite number of ways. There's an old Mexican saying that goes, Tell me how you die, and I'll tell you who you are. Although it is true that death is a very individual act, the way human beings meet their end, even if it is by their own hand, reflects more than just the character of a person. Human beings tend to die where they live, and their death is determined in large part by the place where they have lived the longest. Given that more than half of all human beings currently live in cities, and that people tend to live longer lives now than ever before, death is determined more than ever by their urban surroundings. In megacities such as Mexico City, where death-dealing elements are so highly concentrated, there is nothing natural about death anymore, and human beings no longer die from natural causes. Death is induced not so much by criminal activity and guns, as the media would have it, but from the way the city's more than 20 million inhabitants modify their environment. Living in Mexico City is a two-way street. So much waste is produced in the city each day that the environment can't absorb it all, and the organic and inorganic solids, fluids, and gases that accumulate, accumulate, inevitably, make, accumulate inevitably make their way into our body through our nose, mouth, and even our skin. The longer someone lives in Mexico City, the more material from the environment enters in, into and is stored within their body, thus directly affecting their health and longevity. When exposed to high levels of toxic substances for a su sufficient amount of time, human beings tend to get sick and die. Hormones, pesticides and antibiotics in food, toxic additives in cigarettes and alcohol, parasites in the water or pollution in the air are, on their own, almost never enough to kill a human being. Together, however, they create a lethal cocktail that builds up over time within our digestive, circulatory, immune, and nervous systems. Although there is no single smoking gun responsible for the majority of deaths in Mexico City today, the largest contributing factor is the human activity within the city itself. A historical shift in the principal causes of death in Mexico City has occurred in recent years. From diseases of poverty, such as infections, malnutrition, childbirth, and maternal deaths, to chronic, degenerative, non-communicable non illnesses, such as circulatory diseases, cancer, and diabetes. This recent evolution of death reflects a transformation from a traditional rural existence to a modern, urban, consumer-oriented lifestyle, characterized by an excess of man-made substances in the air, water, food, cigarettes, and alcohol. These days, most Chilangos, Mexico City inhabitants, will die slower deaths from diseases related to long-term exposure to the environment, which is, an, which is just another way of saying that living in Mexico City long enough will kill you. The next section is called The Gangs of New York. Cities have often been portrayed as hell on earth, none so much as New York City. During the 1970s, the New York City government declared bankruptcy and unable to pay the salaries of its police, firemen, and sanitation workers, garbage piled up on the sidewalks, hundreds of buildings lay abandoned or were torched by landlords seeking to collect insurance, and criminals ran free. The white upper classes fled to the suburbs and tourists huddled in a few secure areas while New York City enjoyed a reputation 
as the homicide capital of the world. At that time, my family and I lived in Greenwich Village inside of an industrial building that housed low-income artists. Our building fronted the Hudson River, formerly the site of the greatest shipping port in America, but now home to abandoned warehouses, piers, train tracks, and a defunct elevated highway. Puerto Rican, black, Italian, and Irish gangs roamed the neighborhood, and to survive, you had to walk the walk and talk to talk, which is why I grew an afro and carried switch blades in my pants pocket and then chaka sticks inside my jean jacket. I saw my best friend get stabbed in the subway. I had knives pulled on me at least a half dozen times. I watched kids from a local Irish gang throw bricks off the roof of my building at the gays cruising down below. I watched as Italian and Irish gangs rampage to Washington Square Park, my hangout, beating and murdering as many black and Puerto Rican dealers as they could find, including several friends of mine. I spent 1978 New Year's Eve in Times Square with Arthur, watching gangs throw glass bottles into the packed crowd. And afterwards, I watched a, a, a black gang mug guys and rape girls down the length of Broadway. Even though they often inflicted violence upon others, the kids in the local gangs had the lowest life expectancy of anyone in the country, and they tended to die violently. Despite the fact that many gang members are menace to society, gangs actually serve a higher social purpose. The history of New York City, of New York City is the history of gangs, and the history of gangs in New York City is the history of immigrants. Being that they always begin outside the formal economy and on the wrong side of the legal system, immigrant groups tend to be especially vulnerable and need to gang together to survive. Dangerous cities reflect the existence of dangerous governments, and immigrant and lower working class neighborhoods are always threatened with inadequate social services, poor housing, and bleak economic opportunity, opportunities all of which serves to weaken the community. Neighborhood gangs are often a community's defense against attacks from outside, both physical and economic. In addition, by frightening off the wealthy and the tourists, gangs help keep rents low and thus allow working class and immigrant communities to continue to live in affordable housing within the city. Actually, the, the ontology of the Portable Area Side was called low rent in honor of the fact that it is low rent that that allows culture, culture to exist. And as we all know, the rent here in, in this bookstore is now anything but low. So. <laughs> At the beginning of the 1980s, old enough to go my own way, I moved to the Lower East Side. The Lower East Side was tougher than the West Side and more culturally vibrant. Still an immigrant working class neighborhood swarming with anarchists, old world Jews, Puerto Ricans, and junkies, the area maintained its independence for both midtown Manhattan and mid-America. The Lower East Side was what I wrote about when I started writing, and it was the focus of the Portable Lower East Side, the literary magazine I created in 1983, which I published for 10 years. My magazine celebrated the oppositional culture that existed in the neighborhood and throughout the city, with such themes as crimes of the city, live sex acts, chemical city, songs of the city, queer city, Latin Americans in New York City, New Africa, and New, a and New Asia. My father was born and brought up in Williamsburg, Brooklyn, the son of Russian Jewish immigrants. His uncle owned a candy store on Delancey Street, a hangout for local Jewish gangs. And as a kid, my father divided his free time between the candy store and Coney Island, where he made money dragging clients in to see the freak show. My mother, the daughter of Ukrainian Jews, had grown up in Los Angeles and moved to New York City when she was young, where she took jobs in factories in Lower Manhattan to organize workers into unions. When they got married, they moved into a tiny cold water apartment on Avenue B and 2nd Street. My father set up a lithography workshop and gallery on 10th Street, my town and block, and then later moved his workshop to Christie Street. When my parents got divorced in the 70s, he moved into a one roof tenement apartment on Tompkins Square Park. In 1979, I moved into an apartment on Avenue B and 2nd Street, practically next door to where my father and mother had lived. After that, I constantly moved around in search of low rent, and low rent led me to some of the most culturally rich areas of the city. I lived in illegal sublets all over the Lower East Side, including in a basement apartment in a Puerto Rican family neighborhood on Ridge Street, in an industrial building in East Canal in Chinatown, and above a restaurant in Little India on Sixth Street. Low rent in the Lower East Side, however, was about to become extinct. 
when local and international financial markets recovered and real estate investors had bought up enough neighborhood property to control the market, the banks lifted the red lines and development took off. Even with its long history of working class, immigrant, oppositional culture, the neighborhood fast became a, a trendy neighborhood for all the upscale mid-Americans working on Wall Street or attending NYU or Cooper Union, and the year trust, trust funders who could afford high rents. The neighborhood flipped as chain stores replaced local businesses, contemporary art galleries replaced Puerto Rican bodegas, and condos it and made it rent-controlled buildings. The Lower East Side, which had long been one of the toughest New York City neighborhoods, quickly became a global tourist destination and a high-rent district. The working class Jews, blacks, and Puerto Ricans in the neighborhood, no longer able to afford the skyrocketing rents and, and the steep prices of basic goods, were forced to move out of the, out of the neighborhood and into the outer boroughs or other low rent areas surrounding the city. I moved a little farther. The next section is called Me in Mexico. I came to Mexico City in the summer of 1989 to study Spanish for a couple months. I had already traveled to the Dominican Republic and Puerto Rico, and my lack of Spanish had made me feel like a stupid gringo rather than the kid from El Barrio. It was time I learned so that when I returned to New York City, I could read Latin American literature in the original, talk to my neighbors, and order food at the corner bodega. I knew almost nothing about Mexico City before I went there, mm -hmm. though I had some early contact with Mexican culture. In the late 70s, I worked as a busboy in Los Panchos on the Upper West Side, a Mexican restaurant that was owned and run by Spaniards and served Tex-Mex food. And in the mid-80s, I went to Los Angeles, visited the Mexican section of downtown and the main market that sold Mexican goods, and crossed the border in, the, in Sanala for an afternoon. I was a fan of Los Tigres del Norte and Alarma magazine. I had seen lots of Mexican movies and read Mexican novels, but I still had no real idea what Mexico City was like. Flying into Mexico City that first night was a scary experience, not because of the city's reputation for violence and crime, Having lived in the Lower East Side so long, I had no fear of the, of the so-called dangerous cities. But because I didn't know a single soul in the whole city, and no, had, had no idea even where I was going to stay that first night. Um, I dropped out of my Spanish classes after just a couple of weeks. Having to wake up early and battle the morning commuters in the metro to travel halfway across the city was too much for me. Um, I'll skip a little part, but then I moved to Mexico City in 1989 because it felt like I'd been tra transported even further back in time. Without American chain stores and fast food restaurants, without condos and, and boutiques, without yuppies or euro trash, the st city still had its own unique local culture. Lucha Libre arenas, boxing gyms, huge old cinemas, giant old dance halls with live salsa and cumbia bands, filled up with locals almost every night. Funky old buses with landscape paintings on the back window circulated throughout the city, while a cheap, clean, silent metro snaked underground. Street stands sold an incredible selection of Mexican slash and burn and porno magazines, books, and comics. Taco and quesadilla stands served cheap, delicious eats on almost every corner at all hours of the day and night, while dignified old cantinas and pulquerias served, served fine spirits in funky atmospheres. Local brands of alcohol, beer, cigarettes, and sodas had incredible designs and labels inspired by Aztec civilization or colonial Mexico, and hand-painted signs hung outside every small shop. Unlike New York City, local working-class culture in Mexico City was still alive and well and flourishing. My first years in Mexico City were the happiest, most carefree years of my life. I learned a new language, had direct contact with a culture that stretched back thousands of years, and traveled all around the country, getting to know it better than I did the United States. <laughs> Much of my socializing revolved around the city's art galleries, which at that time mostly showed the work of local painters, all of whom, um, well, local painters. I didn't like the work too colorful and too full of national icons, a cross between 80s European painting and Frida Kahlo marketing, far removed from the funky streets of the city, but the free beer and tequila made it a great scene. 
Around the same time as me, several young artists from Europe, the US, and South America had arrived in Mexico City. Most of them lived in giant, incredibly cheap apartments in El Centro, the historic center of the city. And most of them worked the city into their art with found objects, objects sold on the street and in markets, and garbage. Although they weren't Mexican, by incorporating objects in places specific to Mexico City, their work was much more Mexican than the work of the painters being exhibited in the commercial galleries. I wrote about their work, I helped organize exhibitions in their apartment, and I started up Polyester, a contemporary art magazine of the Americas, where um, work, uh, along, work showcase, were showcased alongside, well, Mexican work was showcased alongside artists doing similar work in New York City, Rio de, Jan de Janeiro, Havana, and Bogota. And I co-curated an exhibition of 70 up-and-coming Latin American artists at the best contemporary art museum in Mexico City. Even with, the, even with the high life that the art world provided, I never lost my love for working class culture. I fell in love with three cushion billiards, carambola, and the hustler culture within the funky old billiard halls. I bought a 70 year old billiard hall in my neighborhood, cleaned it up and put in decent bathrooms, made it accessible to women. Up until recently, there were signs in all billiard halls that read, no dogs, police, or women allowed. I added a sound system on which I played funk music, and I called it Villares Americo, in honor of my recently born first son. A few years later, I wrote and directed Canambola, a semi-autobiographical film shot entirely within my pool hall, starring Mexican actors, including Diego Luna and Roberto Cobo, the main actor from Luis Buñuel's Los Olvidados, cultural figures such as Super Vario, pool hustlers, and Mexico's five-time world champion three-cushion billiard player. A few years later, I bought up a 70-year-old Spanish restaurant bar where I often ate lunch, cleaned it up and put in bathrooms, made it accessible to single women, and added live Cuban and funk music. Both the billiard hall and the restaurant took off right away, the first trendy businesses of their kind in the Condesa, the neighborhood where I lived. For years, I made more money than I had ever dreamed of, traveled all over Latin America, and raised a family, my oldest son, Americo, and the, twin son, and the twins, Maximo and Primo. I had found my place on this planet, Moving to Mexico City was the best decision I'd ever made. Life was great for me, and I was truly happy. That is, until I got sick. The rest of the book <laughs> goes on from there. And it's about death. It, the, the, it, without giving it away, it has a happy ending. <laughs> I, I, I don't die <laughs> in the book. So, so that's it. Yeah, so something. Yes. Um, um, well, thank you for being here, and uh, thank you to St. Mark's Library. For me, being here is really amazing because I, since I know New York in the 80s, uh, St. Mark's has been like a temple for me. It's been like a place I revere. So reading here to do tonight is for me a really amazing experience, and um, and uh, it was it was kind of shocking because. Uh, when Kurt invited me, um, I, it, it's funny, uh, my wife makes fun of me because I didn't really read your invitation. I just saw that and I, I assumed that you invited me to, to, to come with you and to present your book. So I started writing a piece on, on, on your book and, uh, I, and then I finished reading. I said, oh no, I have to write something about myself. And I was really in a hurry, I didn't have really time. So, so I hope you excuse, excuse me, I wrote these pages. Um, just to try to, 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 to fit in here, but mostly I, I really want to thank Kurt for being so generous of sharing the, the privilege of reading to you. Anyway, <clears throat> death and Mexico City, two subjects often mentioned together these days. I remember reading many years ago, sometime in the early 80s, an article from an editorial in Le Monde entitled La fin du monde commence au Mex à Mexico. The end of the world starts in Mexico City. Just like that. Without question marks, irony, or any kind of doubt, I was kind of amused and a bit offended by that notion. But in a certain way, it struck a chord in me. 
Why not in Mexico? After all, the end must start somewhere. That piece of hysteria, of French hysteria, by the way, influenced my point of view and pushed me, pushed me to appropriate this idea. I started imagining Mexico as the apocalyptic capital of the world and the cyberpunk megalopolis in perpetual crisis. So, much of my work since then was inspired by the, by the alarmist piece. It was not hard to imagine Mexico as a balkanized country and the capital known as DF as a ridiculously overpopulated and fragmented city where moving motor traffic was just a memory. In this vision, the Chilangos, the Mexico City dwellers, were a decadent society on the margins of history, surviving on scraps, tainted food, and dangerous contraband items, permanently submerged under thick, toxic clouds. Kurt's book presents a fascinating picture of Mexico City as a huge killing machine, which transitioned from a cannibal capital to a super polluted city perched at almost 7,350 feet above sea level, as a monstrous sprawl that swallows everything in its path, a deadly, ever-expanding concrete and thirsty blob. This, this, uh, his perspective is that of an adoptive son of the metropolis, someone fascinated, terrified, and victimized by his overwhelming power. Hollander left New York for, a, for that city, probably never imagining that he would stay, build a family, several businesses, and eventually become a true Chilango, by passion and affliction. Kurt's story and my own have several, several similarities and differences. He went to Mexico City, I came to New York, to New York City. But I never really moved to New York, and in many ways I still feel like a tourist. My transition has been gradual, and until now, 20 year, 21 years later, still unfinished. I started visit, visiting New York regularly because my then-girlfriend lived in Williamsburg, long before it was a trendy and highly desirable neighborhood. I used to come and stay for several weeks or months and voraciously devour all sorts of media and information. Like a Republican drilling in the Arctic, I will plunge into the wealth of materials of the public library. St. Mark's records and, uh, and bookstores, Strand, and the fabulous shelves of the now gone Kims. I became an obsessive compulsive hoarder of images, sounds, and words. At the time I started living in both Mexico, DF, and Brooklyn, my friends and family, just like Carlos was telling, in Mexico, were concerned about my safety gang violence and crime, especially because we're living in a part of the neighborhood, southern Williamsburg, Los Sures, where you could find crack selling point at most corners, gangs will fight for territory on a weekly basis, people will get knifed on their way to Marcy's subway stop, and at least twice, guys came into our building shooting guns. There were also several ways to die in Williamsburg, Brooklyn, but most of them seemed to relate to gang and drug violence. In any case, I never felt threatened, threatened or in danger. I saw violence, craziness, and desperation, but never thought I would become a victim. For some absurd reason, I felt that I was a spectator, immune to reality, as if visiting a 3D action movie. Maybe it was the fact that my being Mexican and my wife Puerto Rican we were in a way adopted by some of the local gangs, gang members, especially the aged gangs, gang members, who had settled down. We were lucky since they definitely felt threatened by the then imminent gentrification that eventually forced many of the poorest neighbors of, of, of Williamsburg of out. During the early 90s, Mexicans were a pretty rare sight. Obviously, there were lots of wealthy Mexican expats living up there, hundreds of Mexican artists, students, and struggling businessmen all over the city. But it was not common at all to see the day workers in corners or Home Depot parking lots waiting to be picked up, as in so many southern cities. Korean delis, mostly hired Koreans, and the staff of more restaurant kitchens was usually diverse. After NAFTA was implemented on January 1st, 1994, 
those realities started to change, and the Mexican invasion began in full force. This, of course, meant a lot of things. The consulate in Manhattan, the Mexican consulate in Manhattan, was inadequate for a new demand of services and needed to move to a new building. Delis, construction sites, and kitchens all over the city dramatically changed demographics, opening the, their doors to thousands of poblanos, guerrerenses, and other Mexicans. Oaxaca cheese, tortillas, chiles serranos, and cecina were available in several stores. Also, on TV, I was able to see almost all of the games of the Mexican Soccer League, <laughs> a privilege very few Mexicans could, could enjoy on open TV. From, the, from a distance, I, wist, I witnessed my country plunge into a series of crises, from the peasant uprise and the struggle of the ESCLM, the Zapatista Army, led by the charismatic subcomandante Marcos, to the usual and cyclical economic depressions the historic defeat of the three ending 75 years of soft dictatorship of Dicta or Dicta Blanda, the crumbling of the left after Manuel Andres Manuel López Obrador lost an incredibly tight race against Felipe Calderón, and the biggest national tragedy since the revolution of 1910 and the Cristeros War, Calderón wars on drug. Being a journalist, I regret having missed these events, which I experienced through the media, I traveled often to my country, but the fact that I was only visiting in no way replaced the feeling of actually living there. It will be a hard case to try to compare Mexico City dangers and insalubrious conditions to, to New York's. But as any other major city, New York has its own amazing truths, we all know, and surprising horrors beyond the well-known half-myths of huge rats, crocodiles in the sewers, or monsters and religious fanatics of every sort hiding in the attics conspiring to knock down buildings. In fact, I saw the towers collapse from my roof, from the roof of my house, <clears throat> and watched the rise of intolerance and patriotic fervor, blinding, blinding propaganda and rising militarism. After 11 years of war, many things have changed in the, in the city. Soho became an awful fashion mall. The Lower East Side was decimated by a real estate fever, and corporate power has extended its grip all around the city, forever changing its look and feel in unimaginable ways. This probably could not have counted as deadly threats, but definitely represent the death of an idea of New York, the ideal that brought me here in many ways. It's kind of ironic that we're here talking about cities and death in the wake of Hurricane Sandy a catastrophe that not only brought death and destruction to our city with unprecedented magnitude, but also brought the certainty of a new normal, a new reality where an unprotected, uh, unprotected and vulnerable city has become a target of super hurricanes, ferocious northeasterns, and every variety of natural phenomena, giving us several new old ways to die in New York City. Thank you, thank you, Leo. Um, both of you are touching upon the issue of um, belonging. It seems it's easier to become a New Yorker than a Chilango, but that's my impression. How do you be, do you consider yourself a Chilango, of course, and how do you become one if that's the case? Um, and for you, Nate, how, when do you realize, you're talking about being a tourist for many years, when do you, do you ever, Adopted, do you ever realize yourself as a New Yorker or no? Yeah, that's a tough one. <clears throat> I mean, even when I was in New York, I didn't really feel like I belonged all that much. I mean, it wasn't, I wasn't American, I wasn't even all New Yorker. I, I felt at home just like in a couple neighborhoods. Um, in my neighborhood, in the Condesa, it's like it was always one of the most international. It was founded m mostly by European Jews. Uh, after World War II, and so it's Art Deco, a lot of art. And since that time, it was it was it continued to be um, international and received kind of um, middle class or um, immigrant groups. So that was always the most international neighborhood in the city. But and I, I felt perfectly. I mean, it basically, 
when I moved there, it felt like Greenwich Village. I mean, it was trees, parks, boring painters, and families. I mean, it was a real family. It was a real nice place. And it felt really comfortable. I mean, I'd grown up in the West Village. It just felt really comfortable there, and it was a perfect match. Um, when I go outside of the neighborhood and when I travel around, uh, especially uh, I, now as I do as much as I can, um, I'm obviously not Mexican and nobody sees me, but you know, it's, it's funny. I mean, it took me a while to learn the language, and I, obviously a long time I spoke really badly, and I still make mistakes all the time. Things like gender, I mean, in English we don't divide the world in masculine and feminine, but in almost every, every now and you got to get it right. Otherwise, you just stand out as a non-Mexican. So, linguistically, I, I don't fit in all that well. I don't talk. I mean, these guys aren't talking like right now. I mean, in, in Mexico, you, you you talk with more gusto. Here, I really flat line. I'm just like dead voice, and that's kind of normal. But there, you got to like be a little more excited. So, so in many ways, I don't fit in. But. But what's so great about fitting in? I mean, I mean, here I like, like I said, I felt like an, an outsider, a weirdo, and there's real advantages to not fitting in because, I don't know, you, you look around a little bit more, and and basically all the work I've done there is kind of the work of like an outsider, like you said. I mean, I, I really appreciate certain things about the city. I mean, being you know, not fitting in is like being stoned. You're like, wow, look at that. Well, look at that. I mean, you're not. But I've been there 23 years, so I have to get stoned to get excited like that, I guess. But, you know, people are really human in Mexico. I mean, it's such a great city for just talking to people. You go up to anyone. You go up to anyone. And I mean, Cuba is like the greatest city in the world. They have nothing to do with talk. So if you speak Spanish, you could just talk to anyone. Mexico is has elements of New York, well, elements of Cuba and elements of New York. There are lots of people here who want to talk to you, but there are as a whole kind of the street thing is, is much more interactive. Mexicans are much more interactive. I feel really great. When you're there with kids, it's like the most amazing I mean, people are much more receptive to kids. They're not scared, they're gonna start crying and make noise. So, so I don't know. I'm not a Chilango, I'm no longer a New Yorker. I, I have no idea really what what I am. It's really tough. Uh, recently I read that um, Jeffrey Jenny this wrote that uh, after five years of not leaving your country, you really cannot say anymore that you belong to that country. Uh, and I was very shocked. I, I um, really, I, because I never thought of myself not being a Chilango. I, I have always been that, and, and I felt like that. But it's true that every time I go, I feel more, more distant. It's harder to fit in. It's harder to take me longer to understand what's going on to be part of what's, uh, what's happening. Even though I write for a Mexican audience, I still try to to keep in touch with going on. I I am completely obsessive about following the the news and the newspapers and the and the life of Mexico through the internet, which is something that also changed while I was here. Uh, when I when I when I started living here, there was no web. I mean, that's amazing. That was the pre-web time. So um, for me, everything changed since I was able to to connect more. But but still the 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 distance yes it takes a huge toll and uh, and it's it's hard to feel like you're you belong here but uh, but in a way I do I, I think now of New York my, as my city this is where I live this is what the the, the, the thing that makes me that, that forces my that forges my culture you know, I had a very similar experience I was living in Boston in 1990 and at a time of course. Uh, there was very little information about Mexico in Boston. So I remember I had to, the, the only um, library, uh, Boston, the Boston College Library had a Mexican newspaper, El Excelsior, which was not <laughs> even a, a good paper. That, but that was the only one available. Available, so I would go like every two weeks because they would get the original paper two weeks later. So I would go to the library to see what was happening in, in Mexico. Whether this is, you know, the internet, you have direct access. And also changes drastically the relationship though, no? In the sense that sometimes I feel I'm more I know more what's happening in Mexico or in certain aspects of Mexican culture than people there, because from the outside you also have a, very, a better perspective. But um, just going back to, to what you're saying, um, Court, I guess very few people know or um, 
know about Mexico City as an outsider city because Mexico's Mexican culture is so so sort of strong and vital and and but Mexico City how easy is to be an outsider is it, is it a difficult task to be an outsider in Mexico City uh, I mean when I moved down there at first I mean I, I reaped all the advantages of being from New York I mean Everybody said, wow, you're from New York. It was like a real, in New York still had kind of a mythic status there. And so all the doors were open. Wealthy people were inviting me to the houses and parties all the time, even though I, I mean, just because I was a New Yorker, I mean, it seemed like something. So, so I really got the best of Mexico City for many, many years. And I mean, people really kind of believed me. And then it seems, I mean, over time, you kind of are not so exciting and there's new people and all. I mean, I, when I moved down there, there were oh, there was no New Yorkers down there. I mean, they had passed through and stuff, but really, it, it was a kind of odd thing to be, which is what I liked. I liked being the odd man out, made me special, and and like I said, I reap kind of cultural kind of benefits from there. Now it's amazing in my neighborhood how many American kids are down there <laughs> with shirts from like Mid American colleges walking around, same as here. It's amazing. I mean, global culture. Trendy, my neighbor got trendy, like the East Village and stuff, is global. And the same kids you see here, you see there. So I, I stick out now for being old more than for being <laughs> green girl. I mean, when I moved down there, it's amazing. When I moved, and this is a big difference. When I moved down there, I was twice as old as half the population when I moved down there 23 years ago. So, I mean, it's a very young thing. And so the only thing I have advanced is like when young shit say, oh, go back to your country. I mean, they don't say that, but I'm in my <laughs> mind, I'm always like that. I've lived in Mexico City longer than the young shit, so, so I mean, I'm not Mexican, but the city is, I mean, has been my life for 23 years, so, so there's got to be something coming. So, uh, can, can you elaborate more on how globalization has changed Mexico City from yeah, it fucked yeah, it up. Yeah, 1989 <laughs> to 2012. How much has this kind of city changed, and uh, how do you see it? You know? Well, completely. Well, the thing is, globalization, you know, in my book, I talk a lot, there's a lot, a lot about bacteria and parasites. Globalization is a parasite. What, is it, what it does is it first comes in and then starts, like, weakening the, the, natu the, 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 the natural defenses and then starts expanding. The point of entry really was my neighborhood in a sense. There were a couple other, but it's like the most global kind of neighborhood. I mean, when I moved there, there were like, I don't know, five, six, seven restaurants. Some from the old world, European Jews, and some local, and, and there were taco places. Now, I mean, a block from my house, two blocks from my house, there's like 50, 60 restaurants and bars. And what do and the and, and the globalization? Half of all the food consumed in Mexico, and I'm sure at least half of all the alcohol consumed is from the United States. When I moved down there, it was Mexican alcohol. There was some Spanish kind of brands, and it was Mexican food. And now it's not. I mean, half of it in my neighborhood, ninety percent, is probably imported. There's two Walmart supermarkets. There's all these. Um, what are they called? Super 7-Elevens, there's all these, I mean, it's, it's, it's all over the, I mean, globalization has hit my neighborhood hard. When I leave the neighborhood and go around, I mean, the rest of the city is, some of the neighborhoods, the tough neighborhoods, except precisely the dangerous neighborhoods, those are the ones that most resist and most ha re retain their culture. So it, it's changed. As, 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 sorry, as Naif was saying, that the invasion of Mexicans here, that was an early invasion, and then the, the U.S. invasion was afterwards. Mm -hmm. So it's both ways, but very, very different. Yes. No, it's, um, I, I, now that you say that, it's, it's really interesting in your book how, how you, you, you made a book about death. I mean, obviously, there is, uh, the, this, the, the main theme is death. And it's a very, very gory book and really depressing. And for a hypochondriac like me, it's a horrible read. <laughs> it's, it's very bad. I was, I was suffering. I, I was imagining parasites eating my eyes from the back 
while I was reading it. And you don't even live there. No, <laughs> and I don't live even live there <laughs> anymore. And, and the, every, everything I've, do, I've done in, in all my, my years of being Mexican uh, came back to me like, oh my God, I have done this. I'm, I'm going to have a horrible, horrible death. <laughs> so the, the book is, is really appalling in, in many ways. It's shocking, <laughs> but at the same time, it's entertaining and it's powerful. It, it, it has, it's all, all this, all this um, luggage because not only it shows you how the, the many horrible ways that you're going to be devoured by parasites, but it tells you the history of these parasites, how they came to be, how they related to 5,000 years of, of human culture in this Valle de la Nahuac, where Mexico City is ridiculously been established and uh, absurdly been created, such a megalopolis in a, in a place where no city would be, it should be. Um, anyway, but that, that uh, that thing is really amazing, and not only the, the history of, of death. Or, and uh, the, I, I was I was telling Kurt that it's it's uh, the first book that starts that starts by the end and finished by the chapter called Adios. So basically, it goes from the end to Adios, and in the middle, it tells you all this this this, uh, this the, the history of, of how you die, the evolution of death. Um, but the most incredible thing that I was telling him a little while ago is. But when you read it, you discover that, that the, the protagonist is him, yes, and the city, and in a way, the, him and the city are mirror images of the destruction. But also, it's a history about bacteria, about, about bacteria and parasites, about this, the real war, the real struggle that's going on in, in, in this planet. It's not, we are just, we are just tourists, we're just visiting, we're not, we're not gonna be here for long, we haven't been here for long, and the, the real struggle is gonna continue between pa parasites and bacteria, and how they, they, their actions reflect in our culture. And I think that, that uh, I, I can't let the, this opportunity uh, go by without mentioning it. And I would like to, to him to mention it a little bit more about the, to that. Uh, well, I think what I say is that it's, the book is written from a parasite eye view or something, and that the paranoid kind of narrative is parasite inspired. And I say that as an autobiography, it's not just my life, but it's, the, you know, we all have, um, we all have a hundred, well, well, we have a hundred trillion microorganisms in our body. And basically, I mean, it's a complicated thing, but you have more, okay, most of the DNA in your body is not human. <laughs> and as we know from like sociobiology and the, and, the, and the selfish gene theory, genes are what drives all kind of activity in all organisms. Right? And so human beings, as human beings, we're driven by our genetic kind of struggle for survival. But it's not our genes. I mean, the, the, we have much more genetic material from microorganisms. So I explain, and, but there's a lot of theory going on now. I mean, they just... The Human Genome Project has discovered amazing, amazing things. But basically, it's conceiving of life and death, especially, as much more than just anthropocentric. I mean, we're, we're, I mean, you know, Marx introduced the whole idea of class and Freud of the unconscious and Einstein of relativity. But not that I'm saying I'm nearly <laughs> profound. But what they're doing, the research they're doing, is showing that. In fact, the bacteria we have within us influences our behavior, is our biological unconscious. And up until a century ago, nobody knew they existed. And so what I say that God is a bacteria. I mean, everybody, death, okay. well, it gets complicated. I could go on forever. <laughs> but suffice it to say that this book is, is crawling with microorganisms. But, but they're not, par parasites are the, the bad guys, parasites which I liken to like capitalists and, and, and multinationals and all that, they're the bad guys. But bacteria are the, the good guys, the communities working together to defend against parasites. And so it's neighborhoods, it's culture, it's local culture. So it's complicated. I want to ask you about your personal experience with uh, the outbreak of uh, forcing mm -hmm. in Mexico in 2009, which I think relates perfectly to the bacteria conversation. Uh -huh. Well, I am a firm believer that, well, that, you know, like disaster and sickness and all that is 
has its upside. And in Mexico City, I mean, very few, I don't know how many people died from this recent outbreak. Uh, uh, they call it swine flu until the US pork manufacturers in, in Veracruz, who, that's where the farm, that was, they own the farm, they're the largest pork multinational, and they own a farm in Veracruz. And supposedly this new uh, virus was spawned there. So they lobbied here in the States and with the World Health Organization to get rid of the term swine flu. So, but what happened is it hit Mexico City, that was like the epicenter. And everyone freaked out and government warning said don't go out. And everyone was wearing masks even though the, the, the microorganisms are so small they could pass through no problem. But those were the most beautiful days in the city that I've experienced. <laughs> My neighbor, all the restaurants and bars, all the fucking vomiting multitudes that descend upon the neighbor were gone for like three days. There were no, almost no cars on the street. The skies were blue and beautiful. It, it was, it was like the most human days in the city. And that was all due to the, the, the presence of death, or death hovering over the city. So they were definitely good. I mean, but. <laughs> I guess some people can argue the same here two weeks ago. Yeah. Uh, obviously, <laughs> yeah, uh, the silent city. Does not bump into the streets. Yeah. It takes us far. Um, should we open to yes. any questions from the audience at uh, this point? Uh, anybody wants Over to? Turn. Any comment? Any question? You could come up and tell your story of, mm -hmm. of parasite infection. Yes. Sir. Sure. Um, I was going to say my question is twofold. Um, I agree with your statement about globalization or. Uh, homogenization of culture in the world, I guess. Uh, and I was wondering how long you think this has been going on for in Mexico in particular. And I guess the second part of it is I've traveled extensively all over Mexico, but not been there for years. And I'm wondering if you ever miss this place. And language, you talk about language. If I miss New York? Yeah, and how long you think the globalization yeah, well, I come back and forth to New York, so, and I don't really have anything going on here, so I, I don't miss it. And I definitely don't miss it in the wintertime. So. <laughs> um, globalization, I mean, that's, globalization is, is like, it's supposedly like a new phenomenon, but of course it's been going on forever. And if you imagine it in terms of parasite activity, it's been going on forever. I mean, Mexico, had several cities, and in fact, the downfall of each of those cities could be tied to the parasite outbreak and stuff. But, but basically, um, the the immigration was from the north. There were seven tribes of, of um, Mexicas who came down, and each of those were like invaders, and they would come into the valley and basically take over and create cities and stuff. And the Aztecs were the last of the tribe. They came down and they were originally kind of mercenaries hired out because they were like ultra violent, cut off ears, and <laughs> they did like really like harsh stuff. So they, in a sense, were like the first big, it wasn't globalization, but the first big invasion that, would, uh, that imposed a whole new culture and economy or something. Although they started small, but they grew. Of course, the biggest one was the Spaniards who came. I mean, that, the, the, the conquest was in a sense globalization because the Spaniards already had fought wars all around Europe and all these other places. So it wasn't just a single country, it was, it was Europe and beyond coming to Mexico, expanding there and stuff. And then over the years, of course, I mean, globalization is the, was the, the importation or the exportation of European culture to Mexico. There was whole periods of Mexican history where Europe was the, was the guiding principle. So all the fashion, music, culture of the upper classes was imported. And that's an important thing because in all the periods of kind of like foreign domination of Mexican culture, it was always restricted to the upper classes. They were the ones who had enough, power, or enough money to, to, to buy globally in a sense. With this latest globalization, it's much more democratic, which means that it's extending much further. The interesting thing is the greatest resistance to globalization is pirate the pirate industry, who takes the products, like movies, um, music, copies them free of charge, and sells them at democratic prices. 
So you have a globalization where a lot of people are seeing like a lot of American culture, but they're paying very, very little for it, which is, and the profits don't go to the multinationals. So there is a, the globalization is really extended, but Mexico has its own defenses, and the pirate industry are, are, are one of them. So you don't ever miss this country at all, <laughs> or the language. Well, no, I speak English there with my kids, and I speak it with I have some friends. And I mean, I come back here. I come back here sometimes for good things. I, come, I like to come back in the summer with my, my sons and play basketball, and bring them to skate parks, and do like real street things in the city, and go to, like up to the Bronx and go to other places and like reconnect to what's left of like of like street culture here. So I mean, I like it, but I'm just a tourist. I mean, if somebody gives me a job pays me enough money to buy, to, to rent a nice place and something. Who knows, I, if anyone's offering, can <laughs> tempt me, but. I'm not from Mexico City, born and raised, and I've been here 15 years in New York. Um, I spent much of my childhood in the Condesa because my grandmother lived on Sonor, in the uh -huh. Calle de Sonor, and one of these Art Deco buildings. So that was when the neighborhood yeah, we, you know, at the beginning of the 20th century, had been have had all this influence of French and European, but then it, it really belonged to people, to local people and middle class, I would say, middle, lower, middle, lower. It was mixed. Mm -hmm. um, and I find interesting that your story, growing up here in New York, in a way, mirrors than what was your story when you went to Mexico, in the sense that you were living in neighborhoods with middle or lower middle class people, uh, immigrants, other Puerto Ricans or Jews, or, but then you were, went there, and do you see, my question is, do you see yourself as an agent of gentrification in Mexico City, in the Condesa? Definitely, I, 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 fought, I mean, my pool hall and restaurant were the first trendy things, and that led to a lot of things. I got out kind of early on in the deal and never imagined what would happen. But, but I did it with real respect for the city. They were both 70-year-old places. They were really cool. I went there, and I maintained the architecture and all that, maintained the function, but, but was surprised with the amount of, of yuppies coming in and all that sort of stuff. <laughs> so I definitely played a part, feel bad about that, and I'm paying the price because I'm suffering <laughs> from, all the, from all the things. But one, one thing you said, that there used to be neighborhoods. One thing that really surprises me here is that they're no longer neighborhoods, you know? I mean, I don't know if you noticed, but, but like, but East Village, Lower East Side, Soho, Nolita, West Village, it's all connected now. It's all a single kind of, there are differences, but, but Friday night, you go out, you see the same people cruising. It's, it's all kind of been connected. It used to be like different flora and fauna. Now, I'm just so, but the neighborhoods, for me, neighborhoods are really important. So when you say like, I miss, I miss the United States, yeah, it seems I don't really know very well. New York, like I said, I, I don't get around all over the place. I mean, what I used to really miss was the Lower East Side. I mean, in the old days. But Lower East Side is not what it was, and I'm not what I was, so. I have a question for you both. Um, what do you think Mexico City does not have much representation in New York? I mean, that's pretty impressive. Mm -hmm. Even with the new wave of um, sort of Mexican restaurants and this, uh, sort of Mexican restaurants over in the past few years, I guess there's more reference about Mexican culture. But people don't talk about Mexico City much in this, in this city. I guess I know more people, more New Yorkers that have gone to Tulum for a yoga retreat or, or vacations in Cancun than people that have gone to Mexico City. What, why do you think is that? You have an idea. <laughs> No, it's it's uh, it's a mystery to me. But, but um, basically, the, the the huge majority, of, you know, as you know, of the Mexicans living here are from Puebla, so that's why this city is now called Puebla, York, and and it's completely it's completely different. What the experience that they bring is is not the experience that we have. Many times uh, it, it has changed a lot, but before. I remember they, they, I would try to talk to people in delis and the kitchens and whatever, and they look at me like, like you're just another gringo. That you, you, just, you, only you speak Spanish, but, but you're as alien to me as, as the gringos. 
And uh, I, have, I think that it has changed, but, but yeah, I think it was completely um, a different experience. They brought a different experience. Many of them, they didn't really speak Spanish. <laughs> Some of them, they come from the Sierra. They, they speak uh, Mazateco. Mazateco. Misteco, and and some other uh, other e uh, languages, not not Spanish. So, so yeah, no, the the the, the Mexico City as a uh, presence here, it's it's a very point pinpointed in some areas in the cultural domains and all that. Although, I mean, well, the the second largest immigration is from Ciudad Mesa, actually, yeah. which is part of. Mexico City. And those are Chilangos too, yeah. Uh -huh. But they identify well, they much more like Mesa, from Mesa, than I'm Chilango. Mm -hmm. What was interesting is Puebla is, is the countryside, the agricultural, so that they represent the biggest immigration here. What I'm seeing now in my neighborhood is the biggest immigration, like from Nebraska and, and <laughs> Idaho, and those are agricultural states in the province, so it's a, it's a similar thing. You have here like a, a sophisticated Chilanga, which is, <laughs> which, but, but what happens is the city people, well, the thing is Mexico City is everything. Mexico City, you have the indigenous people, you have the rural people, you have the urban people, you have everything. But the, the, the sophisticated Chilangas, the culture class, come one by one. I yes. mean, they're individuals. Um, and the other is a, it's a much larger thing. Why don't they impact? I don't know, you know, Gabriel Orozco is having a show at, at MoMA right now, and, and Carlos programs um, film festivals at Lincoln Center and, and lots of other places of Latin American films, and he's one of the most important people bringing up Mexican film culture. and culture. Um, but in fact, he writes in Spanish from Mexican things, so he's not popularizing. Um, and I never really popularized New York in, in, in Mexico. I really focused on, uh, on the city. So, so when you come up, I mean, it, it's, it's weird. I mean, I guess, well, I don't know. It's, I mean, Mexico City has a lot more culture than New York because it's a lot less of a consumer culture. It's still a producing culture. But the kind of culture it produces isn't so sophisticated or so uptown or something doesn't hit the media as much. So, maybe. Which, actually, I find that I've always found fascinating as uh, Mexico City is supposedly the city with the most museums in the world. Oh, yeah. Uh, with uh, over 2,000 or something like that. <laughs> like a global number of museums, and there's yeah. museums for everything. Yeah. Yes. No, I, I just wanted to, to, to ask if you wanted to extend a little bit on the, the idea of the producing cultures versus the consumer cultures and also uh, of the outlaw culture. And, and, um, and just making a little bit the point that uh, now when we talk about Mexico, is I, I saw my, 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 my little uh, reflection on that idea, that when we talk now about Mexico, immediately the idea is el narco, the drug dealers, the deaths, the head cutters, the pozoleros, the people who dissolve human bodies. In, 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 in these assets and all this gory stuff that, uh, that's what is making us very famous around the world. And you avoid that, and I really like the way you explain it to me. I mean, in New York, what were the, cent what were the cultural centers of New York City back in like the 70s? Obviously, the South Bronx, which was murder capital of the world, where rap, salsa, hip hop came from. 42nd Street, one of the most dangerous streets in the world. That's that was like the hotbed for so much culture. There's so much going on. Film culture, you talk about film culture. I just saw a photo of 40 seconds and I'd forgotten how many movie theaters there were there and what kind of films did they show. They showed not necessarily local production, but like independent. Or they, they, showed, they showed films being made that had something to do with the people who were watching. I used to go into all gangs there and we'd all watch like, like Bruce Lee movies or black exploitation <laughs> movies. So, so there was a culture being made for the people who are consuming, and that's the most important thing. Where you have local culture being made for local consumers. And in Mexico, when I went down there, I mean, the music and I mean, it depends on the on the on the class. The culture class is very international, and the, and the working classes tends to be very national. But now with TV, with internet, with a lot of things, it's becoming becoming even more global. Yeah, and, and there was also, uh, during the 80s, an appropriation of all the, the popular culture, the popular Mexican culture, by the yuppie culture. 
and that that was the moment when I started coming here, and I I I was really kind of I don't want to say resentful, but yeah, kind of resentful of the way all music and cinema and all the other uh, expressions of popular culture were taken over by this yuppie culture, by this middle class, illustrated middle class. But I wanted to to ask you about the narco thing. Well, narcos are are criminals, but the well. There's lots, there's lots to, to say about narcos, but narcos in Mexico have been a motor of culture for a while. They, the music, some of the most interesting music called the narco corridos, that, that, that comes out of the narco culture songs that sing the praises of famous narcos and shootouts and all that. Um, the, the way people dress, even the kind of the, the dancing and the architecture, the, the, the disgustingly gross but very original architecture. I mean, narcos, for a long time were creating, they, they had money so they could create their own idea of what they want. Now they become the juniors and they're, they're, they're all kind of bankers and they're getting more professional. But in general, I mean criminals are, criminal worlds or culture worlds, prisons have always been where language is most transformed and most evolved and where, I mean, there's so much, criminals have always been since the days of like the, the, the gangsters and mafias, I mean they change everything, and what happened, the culture world starts representing them. Um, in Mexico, the, like I mean the thing is, U.S. and Europe is is has a, have a fixation with narcos because they're like kind of exciting and because they're violent, and they re, you repeat the idea of Mexico as being a violent, dangerous thing, and so it, that's always good. Um, also, the U.S. sells guns to the narcos, so it's good for business but but the culture class in Mexico so many of the movies and books and everything that sells well are about narcos because I mean people like to read them and, and they re and they and like I was saying they repeat the ideas of the US and foreign media that, that Mexico's a narco culture Mexico City I mean they have Mexico City is like the biggest distribution center for drugs but there are no like narcos there that just it just passes through and it's well controlled by the political structures. So, so, I mean, narcos are the best thing, thing that's happening in culture today, and the worst thing, because they just represent the government and the military. I mean, they are all narcos come from the military. They're all the really well trained paratroopers who cross over for a better salary. So it's just between military against military, and it sells guns. I mean, for the U.S. So it's a, it's a sad. State of affairs, but it doesn't affect Mexico City. Now that you're talking about that, I, I lived in Rivington, Forsyth, to be in second and early 80s, and you know what that was like. You know, they dealt you know, heroin out of my mailbox and all that sort of stuff. Is there any of that sort of scene in Mexico City where it was that severe, where you had you know, but, the kids yelling out Bajando and you know, all sorts of Pacheco and yeah. checking out the, you know, the were or but, but let me ask you, did you like the neighborhood at that time? I, it was an inexpensive studio for me and, you know, it was, it was low rent. Uh -huh. I didn't like the fact that people were in front of my door shooting up, no, mm. and I didn't like, you know, people pulling knives on me. And, yeah. But I was fascinated by it somewhat, but also, you know, I, yeah. it's hard to say I liked it. Okay, but I mean... Because I wrote the same as you, I think, and I remember reading a, an old journal from then and saying, myself, as soon as I clean this up, I'll have to move out for the yeah. same reason you talked about. Yeah. But I'm curious, is there a place in Mexico City like that? Oh, sure. Tepito is like the criminal yeah, the, neighborhood where it's all the, it's the pirate industry, it's the drug distribution. But that is, for me, the most amazing neighborhood. I mean, it's incredibly rich in culture. Yeah. It has a, lo a really long history. And all the changes, economic and and cultural changes pass through that neighborhood, and it, 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 I mean that's, and that is one of the neighborhoods that's most resistant to globalization, most resistant to gentrification. They fight with the riot police all the time to not let them come in and and and, and destroy their economy. So it's resisting, and the Lower East Side for me was still resistance. They were, they paid a price. There was the, the the collateral damage, all the the junkies and stuff, but. Drugs, you know, drugs are important, and I, I get into it here. I mean, drugs, what are drugs? Drugs are self-medication. They lower the stress. 
the amount of stress that people living in slums go through is much higher than anywhere else on the planet. There's also more parasites in, in, in slums. There's a lot going on in slums. Drugs lower the stress and help you survive, which is very important. So, I, I mean, I never really thought drugs were the, the enemy or evil. And you have a slightly romantic view of it. No, it's not romantic. <laughs> drugs represent an alternative economy that does not go to corporate profits. It goes to the local, it gives money sure, to people there. You know, I saw quite a few of my friends died from those drugs, so. Sure. I it's mean, collateral yeah, damage. Yeah, yeah but I don't, I, don't, I don't know about collateral damage as being so, to me, it's a little bit romanticized view. Okay. I agree with the cultural part. It but was very. It's complicated. The thing is, I think what's much more harmful and dangerous than, than drugs is the war against drugs. The war against drugs serves many, many, many purposes and all that. The drug industry, uh, it's not like I'm in favor of drug dealers or anything like that, but I recognize the, 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 the medical value of drugs. You know, one of the highest, well, I think I read that, I forgot where. Oh, in, in slums. One of the highest incidents of death in slums is from, from hospitals, from, from poor medication, from poor treatment. So drugs are dangerous, but, but pharmaceuticals kill more people. But they just than, came out with an article in the Times this week saying exactly that. That, that, you know, that more you know, pharmaceuticals are given by hospitals killed than cocaine. And exactly, and in my book. Known for a long time. Yeah, but, 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 I mean, but it's an important thing. That's why you, it, you know. But that's why I object to pointing a finger at heroin and cocaine. And I talk, I have a whole section about the medical industrial complex here and how, and in Mexico it's really interesting, the differences. Here, I mean, I, I went, visited, I took my mother to a hospital up on, uh, way up on the west side or something, and some guy came up and said, wanna buy some drugs? And he was selling HIV and other type of drugs. It was, it was like really, <laughs> wow, that's kind of cool. <laughs> but in Mexico, there's the official drug industry, which is for the upper classes. And then there are the traditional herbs and magic, things, but things that have been around forever. And part of that, I would include as part of that, are is marijuana, cocaine, and other mm -hmm. natural things that are used and have certain, certain uh, value. I'm against synthetic drugs because they're usually cut with shit and because they are too strong. But natural drugs, I'm completely, I, I mean, and pharmaceuticals are, are synthetic, so. Right, when, the, when the government, the history of heroin or opium basically is whenever governments got involved to synthesize it to make it, it became more addictive. So. Yeah. But I, I just want, my last comment is uh, when I lived down there, one of my favorite signs, and you'll probably remember where it is, I'm not sure if it was on Allen Street or something, but I used to always laugh because, you know, there's so many dealers where I lived that taxis wouldn't go. You know, my building got burned and I had a party and the people said, Taxis won't go there. They just say no. They don't, you know, and like right down on the street, there was a big pharmacy, and it was just a big white neon sign with a red drug. <laughs> and you could it was like you couldn't escape it. You know, the, the irony it was either legal or illegal. You know, it was everything. Mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> Sure. Uh, the economic recession of 2008 that started basically here, how did that affect Mexico City? Is it still affect Mexico City? Just wondering. Yeah. The only thing I have to say is here there's like recessions and crisis. Mexico is always in crisis for certain classes. I mean, 50% don't have formal jobs. And it's not like when the, the economy gets better, they do well. I mean, so, but specifically I, I felt I, I, I felt a, a, a big impact in the in the in my industry in the newspapers and all that I think it was devastating I mean the last four years have been really rough off I mean a lot of magazine newspapers I, um, I used to work with uh, El Financiero which used to be a very very um, wealthy newspaper uh, it was doing really well and uh, the, it was the only news, all the newspapers in Mexico, they they um, they get the the advertisement for the government, 
which really maintain the papers. They, they, as long as you get the, the advertisement from the government, you have guaranteed paper and you, you will print. Um, the financiero was the only one who re rejected. He had no, they had no, no advertisement for the government at all. And um, after many years working with them, one day in 2008, at the, at the beginning of the crisis, I imagine because they were savvy in their financial stuff, so they were the first one to implode. Um, they called me and they say, well, I, I have my editor called me from, from cult, the cultural section, told me I have a good, 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 some good news and bad news. So the, the good news is that you can still publish whatever you want. No problem, we're not going to censor you, we're not going to cut you, actually, you can even write more. The bad news is we're not going to pay you anymore. From now on, whatever you do, you get, you get paid from some other sources, which is a really, really corrupt scheme that happens not only in Mexico, all over in the world, that uh, it's a payola system, but in the press, that you, you go, you write about somebody and ask the, them to pay for, for their which I thought it was unbelievable for a serious newspaper in Mexico. And that was like the first sign of the huge crisis that we're still in. But yeah, no, the, 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 the print industry in Mexico suffered enormously. I don't know if you've, you've seen that. But, but then I, I think it's important to mention, because um, not that many people are aware, Mexico City's economy is, is the eighth largest city economy in the world. I mean, the, 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 the economy size of Mexico City is huge. It's, uh, on one part because of the size of the population, on the other hand because most of Mexico cities or a, a big percentage of the economic uh, sectors are in Mexico City. So that those two factors make it a, a huge economy. The problem, um, as Kurt was saying, is that the, you know, the, the class division, how, how that money gets filtered, is very, very uneven. But in terms of like, the Congress city, it's, 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 really, it's, it's, it's really vast and, 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 and really thriving in that sense. So even though it was affected by, 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 the, by, the, by the financial crisis in the U.S., I don't think to, at least micro financially, to, to a, such a large extent. But anyway, that's kind of micro, micro figure numbers. How people live in the streets, how people live every day, that's a different story. Well, actually, in your neighborhood, which is like the Williamsburg of Mexico City, La Condesa, which is, uh, I, I think that they even expanded there are more bars more restaurants more fancy places more uh, stores uh, since then i don't know yeah that would be the other side that while the huge crisis was hitting all the world this neighborhood was still growing growing and growing and i'm not nostalgic for junkies but i am nostalgic for the 70s when the city was bankrupt and <laughs> there were far fewer people and <laughs> Far fewer. I mean, there were no tourists, and there were. <laughs> no I mean, it was a. I, I that was for me was like the great. I mean, the closest thing to that is like is like Cuba. I mean, it, it just there's like nothing going on, and and you could really enjoy the city for what it is, and and and, and the people who live there live there because, I mean, I mean people there are live there and not just coming in for alcohol or for Wall Street or something like that. So. But I, I'm not a typical case. I mean, I like dead cities, um, <laughs> and yeah, it's the theme. Yeah. Um, in terms of like what's going on now in New York, um, you know, you talk about Williamsburg. Well, you know, the scene has already left Williamsburg. Now it's in Bushwick and Greenpoint. You know, there are all these kids that are moving into industrial. It's a big too. Well, some can, and moving over into bed -Stuy, but bed is gentrifying from the other side. Um, you know, all these kids are moving into lofts, they pay the rent by throwing shows and, and, you know, living a completely bohemian lifestyle as good as anything that was, in, you know, in the 70s in Soho. So that's one aspect, is, is that kind of thing going on with, with young kids colonizing industrial areas, not just gentrification kind of thing. And the other thing that's going on in the city is a very vibrant startup scene or the internet startups now we've overtaken Boston for venture capital going into like, you know, this kind of thing. Is that kind of thing going on? Yeah, I don't really know what's going on now, but um, when I went down there in 89, the interesting thing of the art scene was all the artists who moved to the center. The, cent the center, after the 85 earthquake, the Condesa, another neighborhood, Roma, and the center, were kind of like abandoned. People moved out, the, the values went way down, lots of houses were damaged and stuff. 
So that's why the Condessa, when I moved down there, was still so great because it, it had just been hit hard by her by an earthquake, and, and nobody really wanted. A lot of people didn't want to live there, and it was cheap. But the center was amazing because the center was like 17th, 18th, 19th century buildings, huge palaces that you could rent for nothing. And all the artists who moved down there, there had amazing places. Um, so that's the thing. I, I don't know neighborhoods. I read about the new neighborhoods in the New York Times, and they just seem kind of pathetic. I mean, the new Mexico City neighborhoods, neighborhoods get written up in the New York Times. but. I don't know. I mean, I'm old and grumpy, so it's not like I'm out there <laughs> looking for the, the hot new kind of scene. You're more active in, in that, so I don't know. The startup dot coms, you know, that's another scene that I don't really make so much. There are, there are, they're building huge, they're building the largest skyscrapers in Mexico City. Mm -hmm not too far from my house on this one avenue called Reforma, becoming a new financial. I mean, 10 years ago, they built a whole city called Santa Fe, which is, is, a, is a corporate city. It was right next to a slum and a, and, a, and a garbage dump. It was built on a garbage dump right next to the huge slum. I don't mean, to, slum is a good term, so I say, but it's a, it's a huge corporate city that they built there in the last 10 years. Now they're moving towards reform and building all these skyscrapers, and it's, it's serious, serious global capitalism. And I don't think most of the companies are from Mexico even. I don't know, I don't know who's driving all this sort of stuff. I don't think it's dot com. I don't think that kind of thing in Mexico, but... And here you've got a lot of like, you know, co-working spaces. You've got people opening spaces and people all sitting around communal tables on their laptops, fiddling with their little you know, app that they're going to like, if they can get a million in capital, they're going right. to like, you know, there's that kind of activity. So, you know, kids, it's not just big corporate stuff. Well, there's there's a lot of there's a lot of Starbucks down there, and a lot of people <laughs> in there doing things on their computer. So, maybe that's what they're doing, but I, I don't know, and I, I really don't want. It, but this, there there this. was a moment that it was fascinating, when, like around the time you got there, when when the these artists in in, uh, in many of them. The, the, were following this uh, Aldo Flores, who's li who lives here, right? Uh, no, he lives here now. No, he no, was living here for a while. Yeah, anyway, he he was the leader of this movement of taking over the da downtown and uh, transforming anything into a gallery. Whatever any space that you will find, it was an art an art space. His mother had a furniture store. And yeah, he made that in. And then yeah, and then he started taking over all this. Whole, that was very very vibrant. That was fascinating. And a lot of the artists that he showed at that time are now the largest artists in the world. I mean, yeah. he showed Orozco and oh. Francis Alice and all that. He showed my Alice. photos also, but yeah. MoMA hasn't called yet. So no, but the, the hero, they were <laughs> And actually, the, the photo show that I did with him was called Several Ways to Die in Mexico City. <laughs> yeah. And that was a long, long time ago. So. And I have just one last question. After your experience of making the film Carambora, would you go back to, to directing again? What was your experience making question. a movie in Mexico? And would you repeat the experience? Mm -hmm. but I shot a film there, but I shot it all in my pool hall, every scene. So it wasn't really Mexico, it was inside. Uh, are you offering? <laughs> <laughs> you know, I wrote, I wrote like eight film scripts in Spanish, all taking place in the center. They all take place in the center and all kind of different genres of like film noir, action, um, a bunch of different ones. But the, I thought, yeah, I was going to be a filmmaker or something. I, I lost a lot of money on the first one, so that kind of <laughs> set me back and, and kept me from doing it. But um, I'm in talks with somebody you know who, who won Best Director at Cannes. Uh, best new director, like last year or the year before, who says he wants to make, wants to produce the documentary of the book. If you help, that'd be, be good. I don't know what I would do. I mean, I don't know how to translate this book into a movie, but movies are fun. Movies are good. And, and one of my complaints about Mexico City, don't take it personally anymore, anyway, <laughs> is that the great Mexico City movie that really captures the city hasn't been made. Hmm. I mean, the, the, the city is, is so much more interesting than, than what appears in, in movies 
made in Mexico. And it's a, so I would like to be the guy to do that. But, you know. Actually, that's a, that's a very interesting topic. Uh, the other day, talking to with an Argentinian friend of mine in Buenos Aires, we were talking about precisely about uh, about representation of the both cities, Buenos Aires and Mexico, both in film and both in literature. And particularly with Mexico City, we found that there were more interesting sort of representations of the city in literature than in film. That mm -hmm. in film, it's really, really has been really hard to really mm -hmm. represent the complexity of the city. Yes. But, but um, do you think, uh, in those terms, it's really hard to find uh, like the movie of New York, or the movie of Paris, or the movie of Rome? Uh, well, maybe, maybe they're... Really mean Streets. Or, well, um, yeah, they are powerful or, movies, yes. What else? I mean, there's, there's great New well, York City movies. Uh, for example, for me, Como Ves, uh, from the book, is still one of the really, really, really important movies. Maybe. Actually, I like... Um, what was it that I told you? The Carlos Fuentes, the Los Caifanes. Los Caifanes. Los Caifanes. You know, when I moved down to Mexico, I mean, one of the great things about Mexico City when I moved down was the movie theaters. They were grand old palaces that mm. you only like saw in Europe. Grand old palaces that had the worst projectors, <laughs> the worst sound so, system. The copies but, were awful. Copies were awful, but they showed the coolest films. What were the films? These really like working class type of. They, they were TD and pickup type, pickup truck kind type of movies and stuff, where they were they were always like they were like they were like uh, popular entertainment, but in the like lower class sense. And they were great. They were really cool, and they actually were good representations of the city. Mm. Well, Buñuel. Buñuel is our well. It's true. I mean, Los Olvidados so was one of the greatest representation of Mexico City as it was being built, as lots of neighborhoods were being built. And but the main actor of that in that film, oh. was in my film, <laughs> and it was his last film, and he was the sweetest guy in the world. He, I guess in like the 70s and 80s, was known as like the most famous gay dancer in Acapulco. He was this like wild kind of guy. He got hit hard by the, 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 the earthquake. He shattered his hip and he died eventually from that, I think. But he was the sweetest guy, and the, the worst thing about him was that since I was the director, he, he he told like the, the, the grossest jokes to everybody, but since I was like Mr. Director, everything's very formal down there. <laughs> he didn't tell them to me, but he was really cool. And you're absolutely right. I mean, Los Olvidados is one of, uh, but you see my theory, he's not, Bunuel was not from Mexico. Yeah. And he got a lot of shit from presenting a very working class, lower class environment. Can I ask you another question? Yeah, but one second. He got a lot of shit for, for presenting not the grand, the grandeur of Mexico City. Just like Carl, just like Neff was, Neff was saying tonight, that I'm going to get a lot of shit because I show the really kind of, uh, my view of Mexico City is not, I'm not promoting the city, I'm not saying it's trendy and cool, like so many books written on Mexico City in the last few years. So I'm going to get a lot of shit for that. Yes, um, the Savage Detectives was written by Chilean expat. How yeah. does that go? Which one? Bolaño. Bolaño. Yeah, I'm not the right guy to ask. I started reading one of them and I just thought it was... I didn't... Uh, Roberto Bolaño, yeah. Yeah, some people like him, but... <laughs> You're not one of them. <laughs> <laughs> what about uh, Amoros Peros? Yeah. Amoros Peros is three stories. I love the first one. Two. One of the stories is unwatchable. One of the other stories is, is bad. And there's one story which I really like because it has a chase scene in a pickup truck in my neighborhood that was like a first in in the kind of the high culture type films. No, 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 something, uh, Ciudad de Ciegos before that. The, 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 the Alberto Cortez. Okay. Ciudad so, de Ciegos was the first one. Like with, with a pickup truck in the, in the city? Uh, no, 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 but it showed your neighborhood before. Oh, no, but I'm talking like a, like a cool pickup truck persecution, <laughs> I mean, chase scene. In, in one of the, the, the new movies. It was like a good kind of action thing. So, I mean, I, I'm the wrong person to ask about film. These guys, you know. I, I don't, I'm, I'm, besides the thing uh, of movies, uh, Kurt has become uh, enemy number uno, enemy number uno of the industry of tourism in Mexico with his book. I, I, I'd rather be afraid next time you go, when you go back, be careful where you stay. <laughs> Thanks for coming, guys. Thank you. Guys. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.